Beautiful. Thank you very much. And let's go to this morning's uh, lesson from the kids' talk was that if you're going to put page numbers on your script, make sure they're the right page numbers. Uh, hopefully we'll do a bit better uh, now. But uh, we're going to be talking about the resurrection, as you probably picked up from the passages that we, uh, we heard read for us already. It's a, a bit of a no-brainer that we're going to be talking about the resurrection. It's Easter Sunday. If you've been around church ever before, uh, then uh, you'd know that we're going to be talking about the resurrection. And uh, one of the things that we often do uh, come Easter Sunday is talk about why you should believe that the resurrection really happened. What is the proof that we have for the resurrection. That's something we love to talk about. Uh, it makes sense to talk about what the proof is for the resurrection because the resurrection is an outrageous claim. And when you make an outrageous claim, uh, you want to prove it. Uh, as Christians, we are very prone to nod our heads and to agree very quickly when people ask us, do we believe that the resurrection took place because we know that's something that we're supposed to believe. Uh, but if you were to hear on a current affair, for example, that they were going to feature tonight someone who claimed that they had been dead, lying for three days, lifeless in a tomb, and then had come back up fitter and healthier than they had ever been before, you would say that show is going to be a load of absolute rubbish. And you would probably be right. Because the resurrection is a ridiculous claim. It's a ridiculous claim, but it's also a true one. Now, we're not going to talk about the reasons why we can trust the claim that Jesus rose from the dead uh, this morning. We're, we're not going to talk about that this morning, partly because we have covered that before, uh, and partly because there's something else which I think is significant for us that I'd like to talk about the resurrection this morning. Uh, but if that's something you're not convinced by, if you are still struggling uh, to wrestle with the belief that the resurrection of Jesus really happened, uh, that is a good thing to investigate. We've spoken on that here before. It's on our website. Uh, we also have books over on the bookshelf there uh, that speak about that very topic, that examine why we can trust uh, in the story of the resurrection. So if that's something that you are still stepping over, I would encourage you uh, to look into that. This is not just a feel-good story for Easter Sunday. It's something that actually happened and something that actually matters. Because that's what I want us to talk about this morning. This morning, I want us to talk about if Jesus rose from the dead, what does it matter? What does it matter if Jesus rose from the dead? Not whether it happened but whether it is something of significance for people living today. Now, let's talk about why that's important. There is a, a common way that we often think about claims like the resurrection. Uh, we often put things into two categories. Right? If someone makes a claim, uh, we say, well, that claim is either true or it is false. And you say, well, that seems fairly obvious and uh, what we do is we say okay the resurrection did the resurrection of Jesus happen yes true there we go uh, that belongs in the real category and we feel as though we've done justice to considering the question but I want to suggest that there is another level of distinction that we need to think about and that is to divide things that are true and false between things that impact us and things that don't so there you go. Now we've got four categories. We've got things that are true and impact us, things that are true but don't, things that are false but impact us, and things that are false uh, but don't. So let's, let's flesh that out. Let's explore what am I actually talking about uh, when I start with a chart there before you. Here's how it works. So let's start with things that are not real. We're going to start in that false column. Godzilla is not real. I'm sorry if that comes as a surprise for anybody. I don't know if there's anyone in the Godzilla Spotting Society who's out there trying to take photos of him in the wild. Uh, I'm very sorry about that. It's not true, um, but here's the other thing that means it doesn't matter. The fact that it's not true has zero impact on your life whatsoever. Right? Now that you've learned this truth, it's not going to change anything uh, about you, whatever. It's false and it doesn't matter. It's just a fun story that people like to tell each other. But some things that are false do matter. Uh, our next picture here, uh, you may not be as familiar with. This is Hans von Meegeren. Does anyone know who Hans von Meegeren is? No, I didn't think so. Uh, he is a Dutch painter. Uh, he was a Dutch painter who was active immediately before and during the Second World War. 
Uh, he was told as a young painter that his work was too unoriginal to be uh, of any significance uh, whatsoever in the painting scene. And so he thought he could do something better. And so he produced works like this one. You see, he took the word unoriginal uh, as an encouragement. He said, if I'm unoriginal, that means I could produce great forgeries. Uh, of previous Dutch artists and that's exactly what he did. He produced these amazing forgeries, claimed that they were newly discovered paintings, sold them on uh, for millions of dollars. It was going really well. He got caught not because anybody worked out that he was doing forgeries. He got caught because during the Nazi occupation he sold some of them to Nazi leaders and after the war was accused of collaborating with the Nazis and the only way that he could clear his name was to admit that he'd forged them all anyway and that they were all fake. And he became a national hero uh, for a time instead. So they were fake, but they mattered. They made a difference. They got him in a lot of trouble. They made him a lot of money. Uh, they made a significant difference to the lives of people uh, who were around at the time. So some fake things are unimportant. Some fake things have an impact. You can see we've got this different category that we've introduced. It's exactly the same with truth. Some things are true, but make no difference to your life. Uh, so in our next one, in 2020, uh, as well as having a certain global pandemic that you're probably familiar with, uh, one of the other things that happened during 2020 was that NASA took some pictures of a star going supernova, which happened in the Interacting Butterfly Galaxies, which I think is a very cool name uh, for a couple of galaxies, better than the Milky Way uh, anyway. And that happened about 60 million light years away. And that's what it looks like. There you are. That is a huge star going supernova. It's interesting. It's informative, particularly if you're an astrophysicist. It's true but it's unlikely to change the way that you go about life isn't it it's true but it doesn't matter it's true it's interesting but it doesn't matter but some things are true and have an impact on our lives so for example to pick another astrological event this one here uh, in 1994 uh, a comet called Schumacher Levy 9 which was named after its discoverers splintered and one of the fragments collided with Jupiter, the impact Jupiter is a gas giant, through these immense plumes of toxic boiling gas into the atmosphere and created a storm of poisonous gas on the surface of Jupiter the size of the Earth, just to give you a sense of how big that impact was. Uh, it was... Uh, scientists worked out uh, if it had hit the Earth rather than Jupiter... Uh, then it probably would have been a mass extinction event uh, on the Earth. It was enough to wipe out all life on Earth. Now, you might think Jupiter sounds like a long way to go. You know, you probably weren't planning on visiting Jupiter for a holiday uh, anytime soon. But on a universal scale, something happening in Jupiter is like us driving on the freeway and seeing an accident happen two cars over. It's a little too close uh, for comfort. And so what happened is that the physicists and the governments got together. Uh, what they did is they put together a planetary defence team, which has only existed since then. And what they do is track as many comets as they can just to work out whether there are any that are heading our way. If you've seen the recent film, Don't Look Up, that's the inspiration behind it. That's the group uh, that they were looking at. So that is something that's true and had an impact. Because it was true, it resulted in government spending huge amounts of money and time and effort in order to do something in response. Some things are true and unimportant. Some things are true and trigger a response. So what is the point of saying all of this on Easter Sunday morning? The point is, of course, where do you put the death of Jesus? Where does the death of Jesus belong? It's not just about is it true or is it false. It's about does it matter or does it not? Because as we've been saying, I think most Christians, and I'd throw into that mix most people who hang around church, whether they're Christian or not, would probably say, yes, yes, absolutely true, very important, very serious business, the death of Jesus. We even have special liturgical colours uh, to celebrate the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And when you have a special liturgical colour, you know just how important something is. That's how serious we are. Uh, but apart from the colour the tablecloth is, does it actually make a difference? to our lives. Does it go in the real and makes an impact or does it go in the real but makes no difference whatsoever? 
because there is a world of significance tied up in that question. And how you tell which box you've put it in depends on what you do next. See, if we go back to those two astrological events, in the one case, a supernova happened, a few nerdy physicists took a picture, most of us never even knew that it had happened. When that comet hit Jupiter, our governments got, got moving. We sank a large amount of money into developing this defence scheme and planning what we might do should it happen again. Two real events, only one of them made us want to do anything about it. The difference, how you determine where you've put that, is in how you respond to the fact that it's true. See, if I say I believe in the resurrection of Jesus with all of my heart, but it makes no practical difference to the way that I live my life, what I'm saying is that I believe the resurrection of Jesus is true, but makes no difference, has no impact, isn't significant. And really, if we're going to be honest, that's how a lot of us live as Christians. That's how a lot of us live in response to the resurrection. We hear the texts, we know the story, we hear the sermons, we do the rituals once a year, but deep down we have these nagging doubts, don't we? We have these nagging doubts that maybe the resurrection is not that real after all. Maybe it's a good story, it's an encouraging thing that we're supposed to believe because it's in the Bible, but we hurry to affirm it and then move on to more comfortable things because we struggle to live with the miraculous. That's what's happening for Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. That's what's happening in the Corinthian church. It's what he addresses uh, in that chapter. He spent the first section talking about those things that we didn't look at. He spent the first 11 verses or so of 1 Corinthians 15 talking about why you should believe that the resurrection really happened. So again, if that's something you want to explore, that would be a good place to start. What he does is he lists a bunch of eyewitnesses to whom the risen Jesus had appeared as a starting point. But then in verse 12, he transitions to why that matters. He said, right, the resurrection is true. And then in verse 12, he transitions over to start saying why the resurrection matters in a way that should make a difference to your life. Because did you notice that that's how chapter 15 finished? If you look down to that last part of the reading that Jared read, it finishes by challenging us to then go and live in the resurrection. But that's what Paul is doing. So in verse 12, he tells us that there are some people, some of his contemporaries, who are saying that there is no resurrection of the dead. Now, if you read carefully, what they're saying is not that Jesus didn't rise from the dead. They're acknowledging that Jesus rose from the dead. They're just saying that the rest of us don't rise from the dead. They're saying that Jesus' resurrection was some kind of unique God thing that happened once to him, and the rest of us are bound to a more normal sort of existence. Now, that's not too much to imagine, is it, people thinking that way? You know, most of us haven't seen or experienced the kind of miracles that uh, Jesus did or that Jesus spoke about. So it's hard to imagine what it would be to live in that kind of miraculous world, wouldn't it? That's all they're saying. All these first century say, uh, believers are saying is, yes, yes, Jesus rose from the dead. That's a great and important miracle, uh, but that's not our world. And so there is this seed of doubt, there is this disconnection uh, that has come in for them between the world of Jesus and the world of his followers. It's already happening in the first section, uh, first century. You've got this disconnect between the world of Jesus and the world of his followers. And that disconnect grows into something bigger. You see how Paul draws that out? Right? What starts with just a few believers going, well, you know, Jesus rose from the dead, but we shouldn't get too caught up worrying about our own resurrection. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, Paul says in verse 13, if none of us can trust with absolute confidence that we are going to rise from the dead on the last day, he says, then not even Jesus has been raised. Do you see what Paul does for Jesus, the connection that he makes? See, Jesus for Paul is not, a Bible figure. He's not a character in a story to whom unusual and miraculous things might happen. He's a person like us. He's someone for whom the same rules apply. If people are not raised from the dead, Paul says, Jesus is not raised from the dead either. You can't have one without the other. They're not just words that Paul is using. Uh, he is drawing that connection. He's saying the same rules apply to Jesus that apply to us, and he's saying the same rules apply to us that applied to Jesus. It flows both ways. 
You see, if our confidence that we are going to be raised from the dead is weak, it probably also stems from the fact that we have doubts about whether Jesus was really raised from the dead. So the seeds of doubt that grow. You see what Paul does with them? You see how Paul develops on that? He says, if Christ isn't raised, if Jesus is still dead, then our faith is worthless. Because what is our faith? Our faith is faith in the risen Jesus. Christianity is built on the idea that Jesus is not dead, that Jesus is alive and is interacting with his church today. He is engaged in the life of the church today. Because if that is not true, then what are you doing here? See, verse 17 to 19 says exactly that. Verse 17 to 19 says, If Jesus is still in the tomb, if this is just a fairy story, faith is a waste of time, you are still in your sins, And if you die, you're lost. If this life is all there is, Paul says, then Christians are to be pitied before all others. Just let that sit with you for a moment. See, this is his argument. Paul says, excluding the miracle of the resurrection of Jesus, if you take out the miracle of the resurrection of Jesus and the associated idea that all believers will rise from the dead on the last day, Christianity has zero value whatsoever. That's his argument that he's making here. In fact, it's more than that. It's worse. It's negative. Because if those things aren't true, Paul is saying, then what Christianity is doing is actively pulling you away from what is true. If those things aren't true, then Christianity is costing you the opportunity of finding true meaning in your life. So when we think about that, who is the Jesus that we feel comfortable talking with, with people who aren't Christians? So there's a lot about Jesus that's easy to talk about, isn't there? You can, you can talk about Jesus' kindness. We can talk about Jesus' love. We can talk about Jesus' mercy. Those are things that are very easy to talk about Jesus as this person who spoke of those great values, and we can relate to that. But talking about the miraculous, particularly when you're not in church, is hard because it's weird and because people will think you are strange. And we know that. And so think about the next time that you're going to be with a large group of people who are not followers of Jesus and imagine announcing that you believe that after three days of lying cold and dead in the tomb with no brain or heart activity, that Jesus received a new perfected body, left the tomb, appeared miraculously in locked rooms before ascending to heaven where he is seated at the right hand of God. Imagine announcing that. I mean, there's nothing in there that's not true in the Easter story, is there? But it's pretty awkward to talk about with people who don't already claim to believe it. And this is the problem. This is the disconnect that Paul was speaking into in 1 Corinthians, the gap between the world of Jesus and the real world as we see it. For many Christians, talking about miracles is great for Sunday mornings, but come Monday at 9 o'clock, well, that's the real world. That's when we need to get serious and deal with things we can actually trust. And so it's important for us as Christians to actually spend time reflecting on the truth of those statements and the fact that not only are they true, that they are intended to influence the way that we live. Because as Paul says, the alternative is catastrophic. Because if those things aren't real, if those are not scientific truths, then verse 16, Jesus is still dead in the ground and today we celebrate nothing. See, if these aren't genuine historical facts, then your faith is futile. Nothing has been done about the problem of sin and evil in the world, and worse than that, nothing ever will. If this isn't a rock-solid promise for the future, then when you die, and when those around us die, they're lost forever. There is no hope, and we are to be pitied because we're putting our hope in something that is a lie. It's high stakes that we've got tied up in the resurrection of Jesus and correspondingly in our resurrection. So Paul's gone all in in verses 12 to 19 and verse 20 is when he lays down his winning hand. 
But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And here, not just here, but elsewhere, he brings those two ideas together. He says, Jesus has been raised, and that's how you know that you're going to be raised too. He holds those ideas together, because that's the question, isn't it? The question is, how can you be sure of your resurrection? Resurrection of Jesus is one thing. We can write books like we have over there that explore that question because we can look into the past and we can try and evaluate like we would with any other historical event, whether it happened or not. But our resurrection requires us to look into the future, to look into something that hasn't happened yet and to have trust in that is difficult. Our culture, we admit the certainty of death, but we have a great uncertainty about what comes after. And the reason for that is because outside of the Gospels, no one's ever come back to tell us what happens. Paul says the confidence we have comes from the fact that our resurrection and Jesus' resurrection are irretrievably connected together. Now, we're going to talk about physics again because physics is exciting. In physics, there is this idea called quantum entanglement. Quantum entanglement. And basically what it means is that you can have two photons of light which are in some way connected, not physically connected in that they're joined together, but they are somehow entangled together at a quantum level. And what that means is that if you do something to one of them, the other one changes. Now we think about that as being normal if they're in the room together, but you could send them shooting in opposite directions to opposite ends of the galaxy. They could be light years apart, and if you do something to one of them, the other one changes as well. The message somehow travels faster than the speed of light. It is a weird thing. They are somehow entangled together even though they are separated by a great distance. This is exactly the argument that Paul is making about the resurrection of Jesus and about our resurrection. He's saying our resurrection is certain. It has, in effect, already happened because the resurrection of Jesus has already happened. It doesn't matter how many years come in between them. It doesn't matter when you were born. It doesn't matter whether your life overlapped with Jesus. It doesn't matter if you lived thousands of years before Jesus. It doesn't matter if you live in the distant future. Your life is connected to his if you have faith in him. That was the Romans passage. You get that in in verse 4 and 5 of Romans as well. Uh, There he writes, We were therefore buried with him through baptism, into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. There is an inevitability to the resurrection. That's Paul's big argument. That's what he wants us to know. Jesus' Jesus' resurrection is the trigger for all those who have faith in him. I wonder if you've ever seen one of those huge domino displays, you know, the kind of domino things that people sometimes do. They can either do like, you know, an endless chain that seems to go on forever, or they might do like an artwork, like, you know, the Mona Lisa or something by um, some Dutch forger or something like that. And basically you tip over one domino at the start and it kind of triggers all these others and this big picture just emerges as they all fall over uh, one after the other. And the amazing thing about them is that the minute you tip that first domino, you know that all the others are going to fall as well. So you've got the last one in the line. It doesn't matter how many hundred, how many thousands of dominoes there are to fall. They set it up so as soon as you've tipped the first one, the last one is guaranteed to fall as well. That's what Paul is arguing about the resurrection here. Uh, As soon as Jesus rose from the dead, we knew that we will walk from our tombs as well. Not because the dead walking is normal now, but because Jesus' resurrection was the first in a chain reaction that encompasses us all. The resurrection is real, but more importantly, the resurrection is real in a way that matters. I suspect that most of us today would agree with that. I suspect that most of us today would suggest that we want to put it in the right box. But what does that look like? Because the evidence, like most things, is not just in the words we say. The evidence is in what we do. The evidence is whether our words line up with the way that we live. So here's a couple of things for us to think about as we wrap up. First of all, when you think about the future, when you think about your future, what do you think of? 
See, I suspect for most of us, as we plan for the future, our approximations of what the future means is basically take my age now, take the average lifespan for a typical human, subtract one from the other and maybe add a few years for luck, and that's the future. And so the general message is to plan to have enough to make it until the end. You don't want to run out of resources before you topple over, and you maybe want to have a little bit left over to give to the kids, because that's kind of a nice thing to be able to do. And that's the pattern that we generate, pattern that we pass on uh, for the next generation. We tell them, plan well for this life. Make good decisions to ensure uh, that you have responsibly provided for your future, you know, however many decades that might be. We spend most of our time planning for the period between the present and our death. How much time do we spend on average planning for what comes next? Now you might say, well, you know, that's Jesus' business. I kind of entrust that to Jesus. He's looking after the future for me. He's looking after eternity. I just, I'll worry about the present uh, in the meantime. And that's fair enough. That's a reasonable argument. I would rather entrust my future to Jesus than me. I can't even number a script well. But at the same time, Jesus encourages us to lay up treasures for ourselves, not on earth, but in heaven. He says there, thieves can't break in and steal and moth and rust can't destroy. And so Jesus seems to think that we are able to live in a way that invests in the future beyond death. So, is that something that we do? It's a difficult thing to imagine, it's a difficult thing to manage, because there needs to be a balance, doesn't there? We don't drop everything to think of life after death, because we still need to eat, we still need to sleep somewhere. Investing in God's kingdom doesn't mean that the concerns of this world just disappear. But let's be honest, if we were going to fall on one side of that ledger, if we were going to be over-investing in one area, it's going to be the present, isn't it, rather than the future. Now, there's all kinds of reasons for that. Maybe it's because we are cultural Christians. You know, maybe for many of us, church is as much a habit as it is a belief. Maybe it's a place where we feel like we belong. We couldn't imagine not going on a Sunday. But somehow it misses our hearts. And so our lives, our thoughts, our priorities are set firmly in the present. And church is just something that rounds out our week. And perhaps, if that's us, we need to take time to reflect on those promises that God has made. Perhaps we need to be reminded that the scope of the plan that God has for us sails well beyond any mortal lifetime. Or perhaps we're grown-up Christians. You know the idea of a grown-up Christian, right? Once upon a time, you're a young and enthusiastic Christian. You used to talk about mission. You used to get all excited about spreading the gospel, get hyped up about studying the Bible. But that's just faded over the years. You know, the grind of life day to day, week to week has worn you down. Uh, And now you've sort of catalogued that enthusiasm as something that's kind of belonged uh, to your youthful period rather than your mature period. And perhaps we need to lift our eyes from that week-to-week routine and be reminded of the wonder that is in the gospel message, to let ourselves be carried away in that again. Or perhaps you're a rational Christian. Perhaps you're too clever too grounded in knowledge and facts and understanding, too sure of our intellectual might to allow ourselves to depend on the miraculous. And maybe that's something that we need to dwell in a little more. That while that ground of the miraculous might seem a little shaky at times, but Easter is an invitation to embrace the God who acts in ways that we don't expect. The God who on the first Easter morning shattered our doubts, shattered our fears in one unthinkable event as Jesus walked out of the grave. And if we're not following Jesus, or if we're just exploring this for ourselves, this is definitely worth thinking about, isn't it? Because if it's true, it's not just a nice event for Christmas morning to talk about. It's not just a fairy tale from the Bible. It changes everything. Why don't we pray? Father, we do thank you for Easter. We do thank you that we can look back to an event, something that we can know, something that we can see, something that we can learn the evidence for and see this historical truth that Jesus walked out from his tomb on that first Easter morning. Uh, But we pray, Lord, that it wouldn't stop there. 
we pray that we'd see that there's a connection between his resurrection and ours. And so as we turn from the past and look to the future, we might see that our destiny has changed. That we're not just trying to make the best of our time on this earth as long as we get, but that we're investing in eternity. Lord, we pray that our lives would reflect that. That we wouldn't just look the same as people who have no hope beyond this life, but that we would live as people who know of the richness of your blessing, that one day we will see you face to face and know a world that is without pain, a world that is without suffering or fear or death. Help us to live in a way now that shows we value what is to come. And we ask this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.